Well, welcome, guys, to another Salem Doodles podcast. My guest today, she has done pretty much everything. Uh, she's a doctor. She's an astronaut in training, uh, aquanaut, travel all over the world, adventurer. There's too many things to list, so we'll get right into it. It's Dr. Shauna Pandia. How are you? I am so excited to be here, Bobby. Well, thanks for coming out and taking the time. We're at the uh, Texas Eclipse Festival here. Oh, yeah. So have you seen a solar eclipse, like a total? It's it's pretty it's pretty amazing. I did the 2017 when uh, in uh, we went to Idaho and it was way cooler than I was expecting. So uh, although I hear we might get some clouds and rain tomorrow, so you know it's looking a little bit more promising than when oh, does we it? started. Okay. So I hear the thunder showers are moving to the day beyond. So oh good, good. Fingers, finger trust. All right, I haven't checked the weather today, so yeah. yeah. So all right, you stay incredibly busy. What uh, so what are you working on right now? What's your biggest? What's the biggest thing in your life right now that? That, that you've been working on? Oh gosh, that is, the, the, the two line summary is space medicine, um, but what that means from day to day, it could be more space, more medicine, or actual literal space medicine. Um, so for those who don't know me, I am an emergency room physician in Canada. I work in over 30 rural and remote sites across um, my province, Alberta. And then I'm the director of the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences Space Medicine Group. I work with a Canadian company that leverages what we call immersive technologies, so virtual reality, augmented reality, um, 360 video to deliver healthcare, both to astronauts in space as well as to help our most in need populations on Earth and teach healthcare providers. I advise several commercial space companies from a medical perspective. So I like to say it's like a box of space medical chocolates. All right, a little Everything bit of everything. Different. Yeah, you don't know what you're going to get. Well, I imagine I mean, I, the, the space has its own set of unique problems problems that we wouldn't have here on earth. I mean, like as far as space medicine, I, mean, I guess, I mean, what are some of the problems you have? Yeah. So if you remember nothing else about space medicine, it is simply that space is trying to kill you. Right. And so when we talk about how we think about the framework of um, space medicine, we talk about the big five. And so that we talk about this as the ridge framework. So that's radiation, isolation, and confinement. D is distance from Earth. G is the one that everyone immediately leaps to, which is gravity. But mm. that's not just microgravity or weightlessness. It's the hypergravity of launch and landing. Right. So there, those are increased G loads. Um, it is the um, partial gravity, that one-sixth gravity we might encounter on the moon, one-third gravity on Mars. And then E, I like to say, is everything else, but it stands for environment and specifically hostile environments. Right. So that means that things that we don't think about on our usual 24-day, 24 24-hour 24 cycle on a day on Earth we, um, you know, we have our day-night cycles, but if you're on the International Space Station, you are experiencing 16 sunrise sunsets right. per 90 per 24-hour period. So that's one sunrise sunset every 90 minutes. Um, if you're on the moon, you also have to think about lunar dust. Mm. Um, in that stuff, we know from the Apollo missions, it gets everywhere. So that's a skin irritant. It's a eye irritant. It's a respiratory irritant. Um, and the lunar day, if you're at the equator, is 14 days of day and 14 days of night. So right. that's what we mean when we talk about every. Everything else. I think, yeah. So, uh, gosh, I mean, you, you talk about the lunar dust and all that. I mean, it's so a lot of people think, you know, they equate it to like sand or something like that, but it's even, it's worse than that because it's way more abrasive, right? Because it's, it's abrasive and it's fine. Right. It's like talcum powder. It gets everywhere. It's sticky. It has an ionic charge. So, like, not only, you know, can it infiltrate places you didn't even know it could infiltrate, right. but it really clogs up the suit joints, the wrist joints, for example. Well, I, um, I know you've done some work on, on space suits and stuff like that. So, is that one of the things you're you, you've worked on or what have you done with the spacesuit stuff? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Uh, not lunar dust specifically. Okay. Um, although one of the, uh, one of the, uh, we did tangentially propose um, a way to mitigate lunar dust in a different project from that same institute. So earlier on, I mentioned the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. So that's where um, I direct their space medicine group. That's all of my um, astronaut, scientist, astronaut, um, citizen science that I've done is through IIAS and uh, the spacesuit uh, call Qualifications and evaluations I've done has been through that institute as well. So if you ever see a photo of me online and it's I'm flo floating in zero G, right. having the time of my life, we're actually <laughs> doing um, zero G evaluations of a very specific kind of spacesuit called an IVA or intervehicular activity spacesuit uh, in parabolic flight. So that just sounds like a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo. 
I said that I just said. So just to kind of break that down further. Um, so when we talk about spacesuits, we talk about the spacesuits we wear inside our aircraft mm-hmm. to kind of act as a secondary life support system if our atmosphere becomes contaminated, for example. So those are the IVA spacesuits. And then when you see the spa- the astronauts on, on spacewalks, when you see the Apollo astronauts on the surface of the moon, those are EVA spacesuits, extravehicular activity spacesuit. And the difference is the EVA spacesuits, you know, need to be a little bit more uh, protective against the high radiation environment, against the vacuum of space. So they have more radiation protection. They have more um, thermal layers built into them. So coming back to what we've done with the IVA spacesuits, um, we have evaluated them in parabolic flight. So some folks may more commonly know this as the Vomit Comet. Right. So how do you recreate zero G without ever leaving Earth? We we take an aircraft, we take a small Falcon 20, and then we fly in a parabola. And basically it's like when you're going over the crest of a roller coaster and you feel your stomach lift into your throat for a second, it's because you're weightless and you're falling at the same rate as the roller coaster. So in this case, we're kind of doing that with an airplane and so we're falling at the same rate as the plane for 20 seconds which gives us a 20 uh, second window in which we can uh, have microgravity float around and in this case test specific aspects of the spacesuit like the fine motor movement um, the gross motor movement what it's like when the visor's down and it's pressurized um, all of which is really critical to know you know how functional is it what needs to be fixed um, and then you know if you're if you're curious I can also tell you what we've done with EVA the other kind of space sure suits. yeah so um, and these are commercial spacesuits so what's really cool is um, this is one of the world's first commercial spacesuits uh, from made by final frontier design so we've been lucky enough to evaluate them for FFD. And so... Um, FFD? Uh, of, of, of that thing, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, what we've done is uh, we've created this this gravity offset system, which is just a fancy way of saying that we have this giant harness and we can offload whatever percentage of our weight that we want to. So uh. if we want to stimulate weightlessness, I would just, you know, put a matching amount of weight that's about 99% of my weight. So I'm essentially weightless in this harness and then I'm in the suit so we can mimic what the suit's functionality is like, what the range of motion is like. If I'm simulating fixing a panel outside the International Space Station, for example. Is this something you do like in the water or like, uh, like, or, or just how, how does that like, are yeah, you in, just suspended question. in the so, air? Um, we have, we have evaluated in two settings. So the first time we set this up, we were actually working with the Canadian Space Agency and they have this loose Lunar high bay, um, and so this is a very it's a room with very very tall ceilings, maybe two stories I would uh, estimate, and then we set up this really really tall gravity offset harness in it. So you have you know this this long I beam in the middle, and it's tethered down at two ends by its pillars, and then there's this harness. We strap our astronaut. Um, candidate in it, they're in their spacesuit, and then your being in this simulated lunar uh, yard allows you to also say, how will this suit interact in a simulated lunar spacewalk? Um, if I need to, for example, go through the same actions that I'm doing on a geologic walk on the moon, um, you know, you still ha- you have the simula- you have the same sort of setup, you have the same rocks, you have the same kind of craters that you might have on the moon. And then you can add geologic tools and see how easy it is to manipulate them and maneuver them in the spacesuit. So we've done that um, both with the Canadian Space Agency and now we've actually moved that gravity offset harness to um, Florida Tech, obviously in Florida. Sure. Um, and so that's what the setup is like. And it's really um, the other cool part of this is coming back to being able to manipulate the weight. You can offset 83% of your weight, which brings your weight down to 17% or lunar gravity. Right. So you can simulate what it's like to, you know, hop around on the moon. You can simulate uh, 33% gravity, a uh, Mars, uh, Mars environment, right. and what it's like to walk around in Mars gravity. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, so the Apollo astronauts, they didn't, did they have, they didn't even really know how they were going to walk on the moon or had they had some kind of training on that? Some kind of training. They had the, they definitely um, simulated, uh, well, they, they definitely tried on their suits and sure. were aware of what the fit was like. And then what's really cool is they actually, there's this place outside Flagstaff in Arizona called Cinder Lake, where literally in the 60s, what NASA did is they dent, put set off some um, explosives. So they could, oh, really? Yeah, in this, un, in this uninhabited area, in this lake, and basically um, the, it was a dry lake bed. And they recreated the, the craters that you would see in the kind of lunar lunar landscape they expected to see. And then they had the um, Apollo astronauts go out there and practice their geological surveys uh, in that similar terrain. And they, there's even um, 
uh, footage of them practicing with their um, with their geologic tools out there. So yeah. yeah, so we've actually been out there um, with our geologic courses as part of IIAS doing the same thing. So it's it's kind of cool to be following in the footsteps of that history. So you're, you're talking about Mars a minute ago. Like, so is that something you would be, so if they called you up today, and because I know like Elon and, uh, you know, this what, he wants to go to Mars by the end of this decade or something, right? And uh, would it, I mean, if he called you up and said, hey, we want to send you on the mid, would you do it? Yeah, that's a great question. I often get asked that. And I think my my follow-up question is, well, what are the risks? Right. How have we thought about the mission profile? How long are we going for? What is the, what what rocket ship am I taking? Right. Um, what is its safety record? Uh, what what am I, what is the, why, what are the scientific objectives of that mission? And most importantly, what I want to see mitigated, which I don't think we have all the answers for yet, is the space medicine right. aspects of it. So radiation, we haven't really talked about yet, but the the bottom line is the higher up you go from Earth's surface, mm -hmm. the more radiation you have to contend with. So even if you're taking a transatlantic flight versus spending a day on uh, at sea level, mm -hmm. you're exposed to more radiation. So at the level of the International Space Station, you're exposed to about 250 times the amount of radiation that you are when you are spending, again, a day on the ground. Right. Um, but you're still relatively protected by Earth's magnetosphere, mm -hmm. which is filtering out all of those higher energy ionizing particles and galactic cosmic radiation, right. which is like the higher energy radiation, which can actually cause more damage right. to our cells and to our DNA. So by the time you're out in deep space, if you're on a lunar mission, if you're on a Martian mission, we don't have that protection. So we need to think about how are we going to adequately protect our astronauts um, against that radiation through shielding in the ship, through sh adequate shielding in their habitats. There's some proposals that say, well, you know, just use use the regolith, use the, the terrain on Mars and build underground habitats. Um, and then what about emergencies? What if there is a solar flare or right. solar particle event? What are you How gonna are do? We, yeah, so there, there, you know, that's what one, example of uh, a medical issue we need to adequately mitigate. mitigate. Um, we know that bone density uh, decreases. We know that muscle mass decreases in microgravity. We don't know with the sweet spot for what amount of gravity is just enough gravity to mitigate that. Right. Is Martian gravity enough? Because if so, awesome. You know, we, we don't have to worry about that while we're on the surface of the red planet. But we also have to think about how our crew might be deconditioned of after six to nine months of right. travel in weightlessness. Uh, and how are they going to get that strength back? So they still have to be performing resistive exercise, cardiovascular exercise en route to Mars, just like they're doing on the International Space Station. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we need to contend with um, one hot topic in space that we haven't talked about in human spaceflight is what we call the spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome uh we call it sans for short because that's much easier to say and um you astronauts and your uh, acronyms you know yeah you know there's a there's a, a joke in the space industry that you know in one nasa meeting or one space agency meeting one day someone was so sick of the acronyms he said no more tlas <laughs> that of course standing for three-letter acronyms okay okay well. um so, yeah, th well, there are a lot of acronyms, um, and, you know, sometimes it's harder to decide. Is it just is it better to be verbose or use it to get lost in the in the jargon? Right. So coming back to the space light associated neuroocular syndrome, the SANS, um, that's a fancy way of saying that in addition to um, losing bone density, losing muscle mass, having our fluids shift upward, one particularly one particular fluid that we're interested in is the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes our brains and our spines. And um, I call it, it's essentially brain juice, if you just need to think of it that way. Um, but we, we know about long duration space flight. So space flights of 30 days or more is that that CSF, as well as the venous drainage, as well as the lymphatic drainage from our, our brains is impaired compared to being in 1G on, on Earth. And so what what happens is there is increased pressure within the brain, so increased intracranial pressure, and that's not evenly distributed. Right. And it's particularly increased around the backs of our eyeballs where the optic nerve connects the eye to the brain and ex as extends back into the brain. And so we don't know why this preferentially affects some astronauts versus others. We don't know why this preferentially affects male astronauts versus female astronauts. Um, and then we don't know, the, the, the biggest clinical consideration is that in a certain subset of astronauts is that this leads to hyperopia or vision shift. Right, yeah, I'd, I'd heard of that. So 
so I guess when, especially when people first go into space, first weightlessness, I mean, they have like tomato head, right? Because all the blood goes up to their face. So I'm sure the pressure increases in your brain too, because you don't have gravity pulling all that fluid yeah. down. And then, so like it reshapes your eyes too, because of the pressure. And so yeah. like, that's probably part of the, I mean, I guess we have to. There's, there's a lot that. going on. Like even, you know, we, you know, we talked about upward fluid shift, but it's your face, it's your sinuses, mm -hmm. it's your eyeballs, it's your brain. So taking that, you know, we've talked about sands and then we haven't talked about what happens to the eyeballs. They become flattened and more misshapen, uh, which can also, which is also part of the constellation of sands. Um, and then the, the other, the cosmetic and the day-to-day -day impacts, um, are, you know, you don't think about it first until, you know, you deconstruct it. But if you, compare a side-by-side -side image of an astronaut in 1G before their flight versus them in a flight, their face will be puffier yeah. and more round shaped. So we call that the moon face. Moon face, because, okay. Of course, you know, right. space term, but it's because of that fluid shift. And as a consequence of that fluid shift, there's that increased sinus congestion. Mm. So um, astronauts feel like they have a cold. So as a consequence, food is less flavorful to them. So it needs to be spicier okay more really savory it needs okay. to be more textured like there's a lot of sriracha sauce or, right yeah right you know there the, the it makes an impact into the food selection that goes up onto um well on, even, even just zero g, g makes it harder to eat too because you can't have bread right because then it gets crumbed everywhere i yeah, mean you're yeah, eating exactly. like pastes and everything right or yeah, is that so when we talk about nutrition on iss so liquids are a perfect example you you know you can't just go to the fridge and open up uh you can know, a can of yeah, well, you can't even have um, uh, carbonated beverages. Oh, right. In in space, uh, okay. because the you know you can't burp. Space, right, so <laughs> oh, right, because it doesn't come up. Yeah, so it becomes very, very uncomfortable. Oh so, wow! Yeah, so, so you're just holding that gas in your. Okay, I didn't even yeah, think about that. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a whole non-starter. And then when we're having liquids, we just we can't have them floating around the cabin, right. so they have to be contained. So we um, like astronauts juice can, boxes basically. Yeah, they're like these little Capri Sun pouches, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. so you know your coffee will be in like a little Capri Sun. Um, pouch and then coming back to the bigger picture of nutrition apples oranges are a luxury mm. because they're wet right they're heavy they have mm. a finite shelf life so they may be sent up for a special occasion like Christmas right but what you ha need to have is something that's nutritious shelf stable be able to um, not degrade in the uh, zero-g environment in the high radiation environment um, be textured be flavorful um, and also offer nutrients and and caloric, caloric supplementation to sure. astronauts. So I think uh, you know we, we haven't obviously there's still need to work to, to solve the radiation problems, but I think a lot of the problems up there could be mitigated on having some kind of spinning you know centrifugal like uh, residence that you live in up there. But I imagine the is it the technical aspect of that that makes that so difficult to do? Like why couldn't they just spin the or at least put a section of the space station that spins, you know? Yeah, uh, so I mean, I'm glad we were touching upon this. So the science fiction term for that is O'Neill cylinders. Uh, this was, uh, you know, proposed back in the 60s or 70s, and it's it's simple physics. Um, you know, the rate of rotation uh, as it is and the so the artificial gravity that you create is a product of the rate of rotation squared and the radius of your space station and we see that come to life in space odyssey 2001 right. with that spinning space station and so to your point entrepreneurs and rocket scientists have said wait why why don't we have that that would solve a lot of problems right. Uh, and so to your point, there are now two commercial companies, at least, working on this. I'm, oh, good. The, medic I'm the medical advisor to one of them, okay. uh, Above, Spi Above Space Development Corporation. Okay. And of course, um, fo folks who follow the commercial space industry will also know about vast space. Um, so both those companies are working on artificial... Um, partial gravity spinning space stations for both for humans and also for science because there's a lot of cool science to be done right in a in a decreased gravity environment so and we're going back to radiation though like so do you think the fix for that is is it more of a shielding based thing or is it like cure cancer type thing would that mean would that be <laughs> which one's going to be more beneficial to us it's multifactorial so even even if we don't get cancer we can get adverse effects and okay. so one that's been often quoted in the literature and may have been debunked now but um their older literature has said that on a long duration mission to mars by the time you get to mars after six to nine months 
due to the amount of radiation exposure, you can expect over 25% of the crew to have cataracts from the amount of radiation. Really? Which, you know, it's not great to be blind on Mars. Right, no, absolutely, yeah. So, right, and then, you know, we you know we can have uh, repair. We It may not necessarily lead to cancer, but there may be, um, for example, impaired wound healing. There may mm. be an uh, impaired immune system um, by virtue of being exposed to that radiation in addition to synergistic effects of being in this zero-G environment. And so um, how we deal that is, is multifactorial. So there are annual limits for radiation exposure right. for astronauts, and then there's career limits as well. And then um, all organs are not created equally. So our eyes, our bone marrow, our reproductive organs have lower thresholds because they're more sensitive to radiation um, than say, you know, our, our skin, for example. And so there's also specific limits for those organs. So then how do we mitigate against that? Um, there's been lots of proposal, proposals out there. Some of them are still sci-fi. Some of them uh, involve creating magnetic shielding around the uh, spacecraft. So creating a mini magnetic yeah, sphere around right. a, a um, spacecraft. Some of them are just not practical. So deuterium, which is heavy water. So you're just replacing a um, the hydrogen part of water with a, an extra proton. So you create a deuterium. Uh, molecule, a deuterium atom in the water, and then just using that as the outer shielding of your spacecraft to just be able to take on the absorption, the impacts of higher energy ionizing radiation, but that is really heavy. Yeah, how do you get it up there? Exactly. That's, so, yeah. and, and to date, launch costs have been prohibitively expensive. Now with reusable rockets, with the rise of the commercial space agency, the space um, sector, um, those costs are coming down, but still putting that much water up there to create external shielding can be right. expensive. Six pounds per gallon of water. I mean, and heavy water is probably heavier than that, right? So, so I mean, you're, you're, if, you need, if you need a thousand gallons, of the, I mean, that's, you know, 6,000 pounds just of water to get up there. You yeah, know? so it does add up unless you're make, somehow making it in orbit. So mm. that's one um, way that you can get around the problem. And then looking at, I've seen proposals from new companies for radiation resistant clothing. Okay. And then my favorite proposal is, uh, it's this 2016 article from the MIT review that proposes genetically enhancing astronauts by splicing in elephant genes. Okay. To their genome. Yeah, they don't get cancer as often, right? Exactly. Why is that? I, yeah. they, do we know why? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, so elephants don't get cancer. You know, you hear that elephants don't forget, but there are other claim to fame yeah. that elephants don't get cancer because they have so many copies of their onco-editing genes. So we have two copies of our onco-editing genes. We see, I believe the one in, the, in elephants is a P53 onco-editing gene. And so by splicing in a, a part of the genome that can create extra copies, of uh, cancer um, editing genes, knowing that we're sending astronauts into an environment where their their DNA is more prone to breakage and to um, injury, uh, means that we're actually protecting these astronauts by giving them more of a chance to repair their DNA. So you know, I think the problem, uh, the solution to the radiation problem, is also go is ultimately going to be multifactorial. There have been yeah. nutrition solutions. There's been pharmaceutical um, suggestions. So you know, we can get at this from all fronts. Um, and then you know, coming back to something we talked about a few minutes ago is, well, how do we engineer a habitat that can adequately shield out? all of that uh, higher energy radiation, um, you know, I think one of the forerunners to that question is, again, creating underground habitat, habitats using meters of regolith right. to be able to filter out all of that extra energy, uh, ionizing radiation. Well, it all just sounds very, number one, technical, and then the next word thought that comes to mind is very expensive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to build all this and to have all that infrastructure. And then, you know, the reason I would never want to go up to the moon or anything like that is just you know i like to be able to walk go for a walk you know what i mean and it's like yeah. see you're and, and so we were talking about that earlier it's one of the uh, medical issues is just confinement yes. i mean like how, how do you deal like basically like the size of our rv we're in right now would be you know it's gargantuan a luxury, uh, luxury. Yeah. like you know like yeah. this is probably the amount of usable space inside the international space station right. and you have to you know you have to have these great interpersonal skills you have to, right. be able to get along really well with your crew uh -huh. um, because it's always really awkward when you're voted off the space hub right right so no one wants to be the astronaut that's asked to leave the, wow. the crew does maybe. that happen sometimes so you, you've done that the space habitat you've stayed in that or what I've, is it um yeah so these are called analog missions okay. um so analog because they're analogous in some way to the space flight and 
environment. And so when we talk about analog missions, there's actually several places all across this planet where they um, these sites have replicated either lunar or Martian habitats. And so um, the one that I've been to twice is called the Mars Desert Research Station, and it's in the middle of the Utah desert. It looks like Tatooine, but yeah. it's, it's, you know, this whole setup of your your habitat. There's a greenhouse, there's a science dome, there's an observatory. And then the beauty of being in that part of the world is you're just privy to these vast vistas and these these sprawling arrays of red rock. And if it weren't for the blue sky, you would believe you were on Mars. Right. It is just, it is absolutely stunning to be out there. And so when you go to these these analog environments, you are essentially simulating being on Mars for the duration of your mission. So right. In our case, it was two weeks. I've been there as a crew medical officer. I've been there as a commander. And you're bringing the science. You're bringing the objectives. And really, like, if you suit up, or if you go outside, you have to suit up right. because you're simulating being in a Martian environment. If you don't, the Martian environment will kill you. And so you're doing, you know, if you're doing a geological survey, for example, you are trekking up these really slippery, steep hills in your simulated life support system and your helmet. Um, you know, it's you know, seems it's, tough. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a slog. Yeah. Um, so, but coming to your back to your point about in, interpersonal dynamics and you know isolation confinement, you know, you have to be able to. Um, the literature shows there's a, there's several traits that, you know, predict success in these environments. So it's having good interpersonal dynamics. It's being able to deal with boredom for long stretches right. of time. It's being able to work productively on your own as well, not needing to necessarily, like you have to be able to work equally as well in group as well as on your own. And there's this really cool concept in um, positive psychology called salutogenesis. And this is this concept of rising to the occasion viewing austere environments as a challenge for growth as an opportunity to grow um, your character to grow your mindset and that's the kind of mindset that tends to do well whether you're on antarctica whether you're in a submarine whether you're on simulated mars or whether you're on the international space station so what happens when we don't do that so there's some cautionary tales out there in the literature and one that comes to mind is in 2018 in antarctica there were two russian scientists i heard something about this yeah so it gets quite um macabre um because what one scientist would do to pa pass the time is they would read books what the other scientist would do to pass the time and entertain himself is ruin the endings of books for the other scientists. And there's no need to do that. Yeah. Right? Like, who are you trying to impress? And, like, you have one person to get along with. Like, yeah. it's not that hard. And so what ended up happening that's made the front page of the LA Times is this first scientist who was having their every single one of their stories ruined had it and ended up stabbing uh, yeah. the other scientist. And it's like, well, now imagine if that happens on Mars. So but, crew selection is so important. Yeah. But it was it, I, I forget, did, did he die or was it? I, or, I don't, I don't yeah, think so. Okay. I don't think he was convicted of murder. I think he was convicted be, of aggravated assault. Might no. be the first murder on Antarctica. Well, that may not be true, actually. Who knows what happened back in the Explorer days, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's some tales that haven't quite made it <laughs> yeah. uh, to the, the common uh, yeah. knowledge yet. So there's also a case in, in Canada, I think also in the 70s, in an Arctic work camp where there was... Um, you know, they would make moonshine to pass the time. And then there was one very well-known camp drunkard, and he would actually break into his fellow workmates' um, quarters and take the um, uh, take the moonshine. And then he was found out one day, a struggle ensued. He was shot. Oh, man. Uh, and then I think he ultimately ended up passing, succumbing to his injuries. And then this is really interesting. Um, so this is also a case of, you know, where austere environments wreak havoc on um, our psyches. But then this is really interesting where international law does or does not come into play because when he stumbled out and was shot and he eventually died on an iceberg, he was in international waters. Hmm. Uh, so I think essentially what happened is he was... Um, no longer he they the the authorities uh declined to 
pursue the charges right. because it wasn't on Canadian soil anymore. And so where this comes back to space is there was this really interesting um, headline a few years ago, maybe around 2020, 2021, where um, there were so many ways the editorial board could have run with this, but the headline they ran with is Canadian astronauts no longer free to rob and kill with abandon, <laughs> which right. is like, well, what is happening right. on, the IS, on the ISS? And um, it, it, to, to, to be perfectly to straightforward, no, the Canadian astronauts have not been robbing, right. looting, and pillaging the International Space Station. There, There's no astronaut beef up there. Um, but there was that loophole where if a Canadian citizen is in international uh, waters, international space, that right. they, you know, there's no mechanism for prosecuting them. So now that loophole has been closed. Okay. So, I, I, I was yeah. going to say, in maritime, I think it's you have to abide by the... The like so if it's a American or Canadian flagged vessel, you have to abide by their laws, even if you're in a uh, yeah, uh, international and there's, water. Yeah, there's rules around that, but there were never rules for for space in okay. particular. And so now now there are okay. so Canadian astronauts. Be forewarned. You have to be on your best behavior. <laughs> okay, now. you're no longer yeah yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. So speaking of international maritime and all that, now you all have also done. Uh, I, I guess you're a certified aquanaut. I am, yeah. Okay, and so what have you done there? Yeah, so I I love diving. Um, I hold certifications in open, in advanced, in rescue, in nitrox, scientific diving, as well as my aquanaut designation, uh, as well as my dive medical technician certification. And so uh, how does this, how are we leaping from space to the ocean? Uh, there's actually a tie there. And so wh when we talk about how do we build those crew dynamics, how do we practice working in this isolated, confined environment of space, what else on Earth is like that that we can practice? And so it turns out there's some very special places on this planet where you we actually do research and we live and we work underwater. And so one place is called the Aquarius Reef Base. So this is just out the Florida Keys. It is where uh, NASA runs its NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations mission. So it's where NASA sends its astronauts to become aquanauts. And they live as crews for 8 to 16 days at a time. And they do science. Um, and the anyone who dives knows that when you are at depth, um, you are either, if you're in that uh, at depth for a prolonged period of time, for 24 hours, you're in saturation, mm -hmm. uh, and you need to decompress at a set rate so any dissolved nitrogen in your body doesn't come out at a too quick rate and create some bad embolism. Yeah, and, the bends, you know, yeah. Yeah, and create, you know, seizures, coma, death. That's that's not great. <laughs> right. Um, so the, the value of a place like Aquarius is if you are 60 feet underwater, if you're in saturation for over 24 hours, you need to decompress at a rate of 16 hours and 47 minutes before you can safely ascend. Um, if you don't do that, you risk getting a dive injury. By comparison, if you have an emergency and you need to immediately evac uh, evacuate from the International Space Station to Earth for medical reasons, for fire, for otherwise, you can get to Earth in as little as four to six hours. Yeah. So you can actually get to medical care quicker Faster, yeah. from, the, from the ISS than you can from being underwater, being an aquanaut. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be at Aquarius to do my dive medical technician training. Uh, disclaimer, we didn't do saturation there. Um, but later on, some of my uh, fe fellow space colleagues and I were thinking like, you know, how this is, you know, this is an amazing platform for science, for mm -hmm. exploration. Um, so we did two missions at the Jules Undersea Lodge, also in the Florida Keys. 20 feet of depth and um, basically we uh, in 2019 and 2023 we I took part in the Neptune missions as the crew medical officer and so like everything in this podcast uh, this is another acronym Neptune stands <laughs> right. for Nautical Experiments in Physiology, Technology, and Underwater Exploration. So over the course of those two missions we did some really cool um, work looking at salivary cortisol, looking at cognitive performance and how that's effective by being in a hyperbaric environment, um, doing some cool technology demonstrations of uh, virtual reality-based and mixed reality-based technologies that can be useful for um, healthcare on Earth and for astronauts on space and just doing it with an amazing crew, um, you know, and just, be, you know, 
developing your own little aquanaut family underwater, which is just amazing. So the hyperbaric stuff, I have, so I have a friend and he's got one of those like oxygen hyperbaric chambers, you know, and I mean, so is that, is it actually maybe beneficial to you to have higher pressure uh, long-term, like kind of long-term like that, or yeah, I don't know. So hyperbaric, uh, there's entire fellowships in medicine and mm -hmm. hyperbarics and they're used for everything uh, immediately, obviously for your diver, dive injuries come to mind, but they've been implicated in wound healing, for example, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, folks with uh, diabetic foot ulcers, uh, that hyper, um, baric, hyper, um, oxygenated environment right. can help with wound healing. And there's actually interesting research over now coming out around COVID, long COVID healing, um, around traumatic brain injury. So the commander from my mission, Dr. Joe Duturi, on the second mission, he was actually there for a longer time than we were. We were there for six days. He was there breaking the world record for the most days spent underwater. So wow. he was there for the Neptune 100. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at all of, so he has his own hyperbaric chamber. This is part of his research on traumatic brain injury. And so he actually used himself as an N of one um, to look at how certain of his um, inflammatory markers, how his REM sleep, what his muscle mass, what his height was like. Um, so he found, for example, that he spent more time in REM sleep than oh, really? in the hyperbaric environment. And I didn't, I didn't track my own REM sleep, but man, I slept so well underwater. Really? Yeah, okay. and you know, on the first day on surface, I was still convinced I was sleeping underwater. Um, and you know, it's uh, you know, so th there are physiological changes. Um, that you notice um, some are anecdotal, some there's science around, uh, but definitely from the scientific on the uh, established side, you know, for dive injuries, for, for wound healing, the science is definitely there. So, you know, obviously when you're underwater hyperbaric, so, but in, in like in the space station and all that, they're not at one atmosphere of pressure, are they? They're at a lot less. They aren't, are. Yeah, they're, they are at one atmosphere oh, are of they? pressure, but okay. where um, decompression sickness comes into consideration is when they're going out for spacewalks. Okay. So um, when they're going out on their spacewalk, the spacesuit, the EVA spacesuit, is operated at a lower pressure. Right. Um, and that's just because if you're operating, so you need to move. It is so hard if you right. are operating at full pressure. I have been in a pressurized spacesuit um, in our parabolic flights, and it is it is hard the higher up you go. And so the compromise is, well, how can we adequately oxygenate you while letting you do what you need to do? Um, so to prevent, and it, you know, if you're a diver, you know that anytime you go from high pressure environment to low pressure environment, if you don't do, take the appropriate precautions, there is a risk of a dive injury or getting the bends or mm -hmm. decompression sickness. And so the way that the, the astronauts um, prepare for this and mitigate this is they have pre-breathe protocols. So they breathe 100% breathe oxygen prior right. to their spacewalk. Um, they also um, blow off extra, ox uh, extra nitrogen by um, doing uh, aerobic work. So they do cycle ergo er uh, cycle ergonometry, uh, I believe is the term. So they use the hand cycle to just kind of increase their metabolic rate and blow off more nitrogen. Right. And yeah. so are, are, are they in the suit? Are they breathing a higher concentration of oxygen also? Or is that, or they just do it beforehand to try to... I, It'll uh, be beforehand. Okay. Yeah, the pre-breathe. Okay. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the, well, I guess it was one of the disasters, but I think it was Apollo um, when they had the fire on the, on the, it was because it was a almost 100% pure oxygen uh, atmosphere inside the Apollo, capsule, right? Apollo 1 was right. a fire with Grissom, Chaffee, and White. And right. uh, the, 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 one of the tragedies of that is because there was a whole Cold War going on is um, Soviets, the Soviets and the United States weren't talking to each other. So the Soviets had a similar right. um, tragedy in which one of the cosmonauts succumbed to his injuries mm -hmm. because of that 100% oxygen environment. So if there's a single spark, right, you know, yeah. the entire... Um, atmosphere goes up in flames and then um, the other lesson learned was the door I believe on Apollo 1 opened inwards and they weren't able to get it open because of the pressure yeah and so um, that you know that was a lesson learned for how to redesign future capsules mm -hmm. well it's you know uh, I know NASA's pretty good about uh, you know planning everything well in advance to have you no know, failures and all that so it, it but that does I guess that makes things a lot slower but you know, the, the consequences of failure are, I mean, you know, you, you can't be saved generally. And so, yeah, like, and so, yeah. And you know, there's this really, really famous moving, uh, inspiring speech from Gene Kranz, who was then the head of mission control at that time, who was just devastated that this happened under his watch. And, you know, this, if you, if you Google the tough and competent speech, or if you ha hear anyone in space talk about being tough and competent, it comes from this, this, incredibly moving speech of you know 
taking ownership of what happened on his watch mm -hmm. and resolving to do better and resolving to come back the next day and work another day despite losing, you know, three very close colleagues because he's committed to being tough and being the best there is and being competent. So it's just, you know, that is one of the one of the her heritage um, speeches from Spaceflight that, you know, I think mo motivate a lot of us to, to excel at what we do. So are you uh, actually doing any more current training on, on to become an astronaut or how does that how does how does one become an astronaut? I mean like yeah, how do you how do you get how do you get up into space? Yeah, that's a great question. So once upon a time the only way to become an astronaut was to go through space agency selection through your respective nations. So for me it would be through the Canadian Space Agency, for Americans it would be through NASA, there's the European Space Agency. And so in Canada there have been four selections to date in 1983, 1992, 2009, 2016. Um, so there's few and far between. Right. So there's always that's always one route. But with the rise of commercial space, there are increasing opportunities both through suborbital flight with either Virgin Galactic or uh, SpaceX, uh, sorry, Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin or through orbital, orbital flight with SpaceX or Axiom. And so the difference between the two is orbital flight is essentially like a, a hyper, a parabolic profile. So you're really going up on this high arc and your flight is minutes and you're mm -hmm. experiencing minutes of microgravity um and then if you're on an orbital flight that's what you see with the international space station you right know, you can stay up in space for days or even months at a time and so with the rise of commercial space there's opportunities to get to either suborbital right. or orbital space so my current trajectory um i've been with the international institute for astronautical sciences for almost a decade now we had our, our first suborbital astronaut research flight in November of last year. I was one of the scientific leads on that team. Um, so now, well, there are no flight announcements yet for, for myself or from our uh, institution, but we are basically, with that first successful flight, we are committed to not just having one flight, but creating an entire research pathway for future astronauts to not just get more people to space and make space more accessible, but also use microgravity as the next next great research laboratory. Well, I mean, what what are some of the you know ben what are some of the things that can come out of that research? Like yeah, to yeah. So I can talk about the science between behind our flight. Um, so we had three payloads. One was a physical sciences payload looking at fluid cell behavior in microgravity. One was a biomonitoring payload. And one was a continuous glucose monitor payload, which is the one I, that, that I led. And so, when oh, we, right. yeah. And so when we talk about why all of those things matter, because it'll just sound like jargony terms, like how do we know we're just not nerding out on something that's cool versus something that has benefit for Earth? So for example, with continuous glucose monitoring, it has multiple impacts. So one consequence of being in orbital space flight is we astronauts we see that they have accelerated aging they have uh, cardio increased cardiovascular stiffening increased arterial stiffening and then interestingly enough some uh, di some astronauts showed pre-diabetic changes so we actually don't know how quickly that occurs so then the qu question that we were trying to answer is first of all can we send a continuous glucose monitor to a weightless right. environment and will it work and yeah. we demonstrated that on our parabolic flights okay and then um with this our question was well how quickly are we seeing those changes are they possibly a consequence of the um hyper uh gravity and the microgravity environments is there more to it um, so that's the data that we're currently uh, writing up. And that has that has a couple of impacts because it gives us insights into how quickly those changes may occur in astronauts. And it, that will give us further insight into creating countermeasures against right. that. And it also gives us further insight into diabetic changes for every person who might experience or may be at risk of that on Earth. And particularly, it also increases accessibility because it shows that we can safely fly these continuous glucose monitors to space. So if you're a type 1 diabetic, that's one less hurdle right. um, on the path towards inclusivity and accessibility to space. That's great. So, I mean, I guess, do they, they have any ideas on, on why that's happening, like be, becoming possibly diabetic or pre-diabetic? Yeah, it's it seems to be multifactorial because uh, part of it comes back to uh, increased, uh, that accelerated aging that I was just talking about. So uh, part of it can be a stress response. Mm. We know, uh, and part of the mechanism still needs to be delineated. So, right. so kind of is the short answer to that. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, what do you what do you what are you working on next? Uh, any big any big projects coming up that you that you're excited about? Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's so much. Um, honestly, it depends on on the day day to day. Um, so I earlier had talked about my role with Luxonic Technologies, and so that's the company we leverage immersive um, technology. Um, VR, mixed reality, augmented reality to deliver healthcare to astronauts in space and oh, wow. yeah. um, fo- folks on Earth. And so my origin story into um, this company actually came from the Neptune mission because we initially partnered with Luxonic to bring their imaging platform down underwater. So this is the world's first digital twin of a radiology workflow. So normally if you're a radiologist, to read images, to interpret them, to make a report, you require office space. You require high resolution monitors to be able to use your tools and see the images. So we virtualize that entire workflow and you have it in a headset. So, you know, the joke that we have the company is you could be a radiologist and read your images from the beach. Yeah, hey. (laughs) So, but the use case obviously is in, in resource poor areas such as space where having physical spaces at a premium or, yeah. you know, being in a rural setting, which I often work in, um, is, you know, you, you need to be able to think of a different way to be able to have the same access to those radiological tools. So I tested that on our underwater mission. And what was really cool is as the crew medical officer underwater, I was, man- I managed to link up with the head of radiology in Saskatoon, Canada, over 4,600 kilometers away. Yeah. And we were able to review the imaging together in this virtual space of a simulated trauma patient. So um, I'm continuing. So after that, I came on board with the company um, as one of their employees. And um, now we have pioneered some really cool stuff. So we have um, been funded by the Canadian Space Agency to build one of the world's first mixed reality point of care ultrasound machines. So it's the same premise. You can perform an ultrasound if you're in an austere environment. You slip on your headset, your screen's floating in front of your head. So we we built that um, prototype. We made it. We were one of the top five finalists with the Canadian Space Agency and now we're just testing it out so hopefully we can do that use use that to bring benefit to rural remote isolated environments yeah. in need well there's a lot of that it trickles down you know so they I mean like velcro right i mean that came out of the space program i mean or something stuff i think it did anyway i'm not sure but you know like how many things are developed for space and then it gets end up being used totally. here for that yeah that. you great. know telemedicine has its origins in um space flight mm-hmm. um icu monitoring uh bio monitoring all of that you know comes from space and there's actually you know this is a whole new golden age for um, space medicine and its impacts on Earth. Sure. So um, what I'll be talking about in my talk here at the Texas Eclipse Festival is the future of space medicine. Um, but we can't forget why we do this, why we do this for Earth. So pharmaceuticals in space mm. grow differently. The protein crystals grow more symmetrically and grow larger, which has impacts for drug development, right. which is super cool. Um, one of, there's this really cool company out there called Lambda Vision, and they're using the International Space Station as a weightless laboratory to print protein layers of the retina at the back of the eyeball, layer by layer, which is so much harder to do in 1G. Right. Um, and that though, that pro- manufacturing method can help uh, combat macular degeneration, oh, wow. retinosa pigmentosa, these, these effects that can blind people back on Earth. Sure. So we're actually seeing a lot of benefit from um, you know, space medicine and research, biomedical research done in space or return back on Earth. Um, yeah, and you were also asking what else I'm working on. Honestly, there's there's a lot, so there's a lot of research. <laughs> you stay so, pretty busy. Yeah, we're so in addition to writing up the research from um, our first uh, research flight with Virgin Galactic, uh, we also partnered with um, Nebula R&D, the Saudi Space Agency, and AX2 to send up six neuroscience payloads on the AX2 commercial mission. So the results of that should be coming out shortly. Cool. Um, I have just started as an aeromedical transport physician, which is so cool to me. Hey, aero, is that like a, a physician on a plane type thing? or exactly. how, Okay. So if you, basically if a patient needs to be transported, um, you know, from one country to another mm-hmm. that needs to be repatriated, brought back home, but they need medical supervision, you know, they need a doctor. So in some cases that'll be me. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot that's on the horizon. Um, and then uh, I will be attending the University of Texas Medical Branch Principles of Aviation and Space Medicine short course this summer, which has kind of been one of those really cool nerdy things I've been wanting to do for a really long time. <laughs> so 
Um, there's a couple of more announcements that I can't talk about. Okay. Yet, but maybe we'll need a part two. All right. Um, but I promise you they're really, really exciting. Well, how, how can people look you up if they want more information about you? Uh, yeah, I am definitely online. Um, the most common conversation I have with people before I've met them is, oh, hey, I know you from LinkedIn or I know you from sure. social media. So you can find me um on LinkedIn, Shauna Pandya, M-D, S-H-A-W-N-A. -A. Last name is Pandya, P-A-N-D-Y-A. And then I am on Instagram and Twitter as at Shauna Pandya. Uh, that's my website, shaunapandya.com. And then I'm also on Facebook, Shauna Pandya Official. So if you have questions, come find me. I would love to hear from you. All right. Well, thanks for stopping in for us today. It was great chatting with you. And I, I, you stay pretty busy. This is awesome. Thank you so much <laughs> for having right. me. All right. Well, enjoy the eclipse. And uh, hopefully uh, we have some sunshine. Well, hopefully not cloudy. <laughs> yeah, the sunshine exactly. will be a little optional there. Yeah, probably. exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Shauna.